Lissa Productions. Welcome back to Experimental Physics and the final experiment in our series on radioactivity. Today we're going to be investigating the radioactive decay law and measuring a half-life of an isotope. So what we have is the number of nuclei of a particular kind that survives for some time t is the number that you start with at t equals zero times a decreasing exponential function e to the minus lambda t and lambda is the probability per unit time of a decay. So what we'll be determining ultimately is the half-life of the material which is related to the decay probability. It's just the natural log of two divided by the decay probability. And we get this information from the slope of a plot of the natural log of the number of counts as a function of time. So two essential pieces of information that you'll need. First of all, you have to know exactly what the time is for each of What we'll do is uh, to set up the detector with the appropriate uh, operating voltage and counting interval, but we need to know a, uh, a real clock time. And to do that, you'll either need a stopwatch or many of you have smartphones and you can just use the stopwatch function on your smartphone uh, just as good. So you need to have a timing device of some sort that will measure running clock time from the moment that you declare to be t equals zero. Then each of the data points that you record needs to be associated with some clock time starting at t equals zero. So we'll start the stopwatch at the moment that we begin the first count and you simply let the stopwatch run continuously through the entire lab period read the stopwatch at the moment that you begin each new counting interval. So that will give you the time information that you need. The other thing to be aware of is that what the Geiger counter records is not the number of decays from the source, it's the number of uh, events that happen from all sources including background. So you'll measure a total number and then correct for the presence of background. So before you even get your source, uh, remember to take an independent measurement of the background count and correct all of your subsequent measurements for background before doing the analysis. So that's uh, the basic idea. Then we get the decay probability from the slope and then calculate the half-life from the decay probability. Some radioactive materials are created by a process called neutron activation. The stable isotope is exposed to a flux of thermal neutrons and for our neutron source we have a, uh, a source of plutonium-239. This is an alpha decay to uranium-235 and the plutonium source is surrounded by a jacket of beryllium-9 the beryllium captures the alpha particle and turns into carbon-13, which quickly decays into carbon-12 plus a neutron. So this is a, a good neutron source, but the neutrons that come directly from the source are rather high energy. So surrounding the plutonium-beryllium source, we have a bucket of paraffin wax, which serves as a neutron moderator. The neutrons collide with the protons in the paraffin and bounce around and gradually lose energy uh, down to the point where they are very likely to be captured by some stable material. So what we do is to place the stable material into one of these ports surrounding the neutron source. And we'll just lower the source into the container. And that exposes the material to the flux of thermal neutrons and uh, gradually activating the material to a point where it's useful to be analyzed. So we leave the material in the neutron source for some appropriate amount of time, uh, at least three half-lives or more, to activate a sufficient number of the nuclei to be measured. So that's the neutron activation process. So the apparatus uh, it consists of the uh, Geiger counter tube and the high voltage power supply and timer. We turn on the counter at the back with the red power button and then we select the appropriate function with the display select button. 
So the first thing to do is to set the time interval and what we'd like to do is to count for a total of five minutes. So we'll turn up the time to 300 seconds. There we are. So 300 seconds, a five minute counting interval. And then we go to the high voltage and set the high voltage to whatever you determine previously. Uh, or if we're just uh, trusting the manufacturer, we'll just set this to 900 volts or, or whatever you've determined from your previous experiment. Okay, so 900 volts or whatever operating voltage you previously determined. And finally, we reset the display to the counting mode. Now, you will receive your source. This is uh, indium, and you'll just have a bunch of little indium metal chips in a little can. So what you'll do is just remove the cover from the can and set that aside, and then place the indium chips on the shelf as close as you can get it to the detector and just leave it there undisturbed for the rest of the lab period. Then what we'll do, we need a, a timing device, either a stopwatch or your uh, smartphone if you have a stopwatch function on your smartphone. What we'll do is at the time that you declare to be t equals zero, you begin the first counting interval. So start the stopwatch, which is premature. Let me stop that. Uh, and start it over again. Yeah, we'll just cut that. <coughs> Not used to doing this upside down. <laughs> so you'll need a timing device, either a, a stopwatch or if you have a smartphone with a stopwatch function built into it. The important thing is that you need to have a record of the time at which you begin each new count. So, so what you'll need to do is to start the stopwatch and the first counting interval at the time that you declare to be t equals zero. So we'll just do this both at the same time. So leave the stopwatch running continuously. Don't reset the stopwatch but allow the instrument to count the number of counts in the preset time interval of 300 seconds. So this will stop when the counting interval is completed. Just record the data and then reset the counter to zero, but don't reset the stopwatch. Continue to let the stopwatch run, um, but read the stopwatch when you begin each new count. So let's suppose that one count has been completed and you record the data, reset the counter to zero, and at the moment that you're ready to begin the new count, read the stopwatch when you start the new count. So that's uh, whatever time that happened to be. So you record the time from the stopwatch at the moment that you begin each of the new counting intervals. So just repeat this process as many, for as many intervals as you can fit into a 90 minute lab period and then proceed to do the analysis. So just to recap, what you're doing is measuring the total number of counts on the instrument as a function of time, correcting the total counts for the presence of background, then take um, and then from that information, you will determine the half-life and compare it to the published value.